Hi, my name is Robert Merget, and today I'm here to present you the Raccoon attack, finding and exploiting most significant bit oracles in TLS DHE. This work is a joint research effort with Markus Brinkmann, Nimrod Aviram, Nuray Zamorowski, Johannes Mittmann, and Jörg Schwenk. For this audience, I don't think TLS needs much of an introduction. The TLS protocol uses a handshake protocol to negotiate cryptographic algorithms and keys. TLS exists in many versions, but we will focus on TLS 1.2 and older versions for this talk. We will also focus on cipher suits, which negotiate a finite field diffie hammond key exchange. When we look into the TLS handshake in more detail, we will see that the handshake starts with a client and server exchanging cryptographic nonces. After that, the server is choosing a private key and then sends diffie hammond parameters and its public key together with a signature to the client. The client then chooses its own private key and responds with its own public diffie hammond key. And with that, both parties can compute the shared secret g to the power of AB. Once this shared secret is computed, both parties can derive a master secret by using a pseudorandom function with a shared secret, the nonces, and a label as input. This master secret is then used to derive the keys for the symmetric ciphers. If you look at this design from this high level view, the design looks fine at first glance, but the devil is always in the detail. For our raccoon attack, we will take advantage of two things. Firstly, and what is missing in this kind of depiction, is the fact that when the shared secret is converted from a number representation to a byte sequence, leading bytes that contain only zeros are stripped from the shared secret before they enter the pseudorandom function. The second thing the raccoon attack takes advantage of is that some servers reuse their diffie hammond public key, meaning that the step where the server chooses its private key is skipped and the key remains static for multiple connections. This can either be the case because of performance optimizations or due to a static diffie hammond cipher suit. But why is this problematic that leading zero bytes are stripped from the shared secret before they enter the pseudorandom function? Well, the core of the problem is that the pseudorandom function is based on hash functions. And these hash functions have a runtime of O of n and not O of 1. This means that the runtime of a hash function is dependent on the input length. We all know that this is intuitively true, as hashing a gigabyte of data is much slower than hashing only a few kilobytes. However, since the shared secret is not of constant length now, the execution time of a pseudorandom function may vary depending on a leading zero byte. This creates a timing side channel, which internally may arise from the number of invoked compression functions, if a hash function is used at all, the padding, or may not even be a timing side channel, but a bug in the implementation. On a high level, the attack now works as follows. The attacker first has to observe a finite field if he had a handshake. He then extracts the client's public key g to the power of a and multiplies it with g to the power of r, where r is a random attacker chosen number. It sends it to the server as part of an attacker-initiated connection together with an invalid finished message. The server which receives the public key will compute the shared secret as g to the power of ab times g to the power of rb. And as you might have noticed, g to the power of ab is the original pre-master secret and g to the power of rb is a factor the attacker can compute himself. The server will then try to decrypt a finished message from the attacker and notices that it is not encrypted correctly as the attacker does not know the shared secret. The server will then close the connection or send an alert message. In return, the attacker measures the time it took the server to process this message. Um, and if the attacker thinks that the message was processed faster than usual, the attacker can conclude that the shared secret started with a zero byte. While if the server took a little longer, the attacker concludes that the shared secret did not start with a leading zero byte. To compute the original shared secret, the attacker needs to perform the same measurement multiple times to find many values for R for which the resulting shared secret starts with a leading zero byte. Once the attacker has collected enough R values, the attacker can construct an equation system which can be interpreted as an instance of a hidden number problem, where g to the power of AB is the hidden number and g to the power of RB is the public factor. The attacker can then solve this equation system with a hidden number problem solver to retrieve the shared secret g to the power of AB. Once the attacker has the g to the power of AB, the attacker can compute the master secret of a connection and get all the symmetric keys and therefore can decrypt everything. The runtime of the attack varies on the length of the diffie hammond keys, as this influences the number of equations the attacker needs to solve for the hidden number problem. 
The number of handshakes the attacker has to perform for each equation in return varies heavily depending on the side channel quality, the proximity of the attacker to the target server, and the number of leading zero bytes the attacker needs to solve for the number problem. Nevertheless, generally speaking, the attacker needs to collect roughly 200 equations, which may require millions of connections to the server, as the attacker might have to re-measure uh, the handshake multiple times to make sure he does not make any mistakes. For our parameters, the hidden number problem solver then required up to three hours to solve this equation system. To estimate the impact of a vulnerability, we analyzed the Alexa top 100,000 for the uh, DHE support and whether they reuse ephemeral keys or not. We found that roughly one third of the servers support at least one DHE cipher suit and that 11% of those servers were reusing their Diffie Hammond keys. But to exploit the vulnerability, it's generally not enough that the server supports the cipher suit. The client connection you want to tap also has to support and negotiate a vulnerable cipher suit. Firefox was the last major browser to drop support for DHE cipher suits, and as of 2021, no significant browser supports DHE anymore. The tech is therefore mostly mitigated for browsers. During our scans, we also searched for servers which lead leading zero bytes without timing differences. We discovered that some older F5 Big IP variants had a bug which caused them to send different amounts of alert messages depending on the leading byte. We disclosed this vulnerability to F5, which provided a patch for the issue. We also found that some servers with similar side channels exist, which we could not attribute to a specific vendor. However, none of these unattributed servers was re were reusing the ephemeral keys, and they are therefore not exploitable. As of countermeasures, there are general lessons to be learned as the tech technique is not TLS specific. Generally, it's not a good idea. Uh, it's a good idea to avoid leaking partial information about secret values. A good design approach to achieve this is to ensure that all secret values are of constant size within computations. This avoids all kinds of shenanigans that can happen when variable length secret values are used. For TLS, clients should avoid using DHE cipher suits from now on, as they cannot know if the server they are connecting to is reusing the ephemeral keys or not. Further, we recommend that servers do not reuse ephemeral keys. Most implementations offer configuration features for this purpose. Finally, the already unused static Diffie Hammond uh, handshake should not be used anymore, as reuse of Diffie Hammond keys is done by design in these cipher suits. Since I now talked a lot about things you should not do anymore, let's talk about the things you should do instead. TS102 also offers elliptic curve Diffie Hammond handshakes, and for the elliptic curve handshake, TLS preserves leading zero bytes of a pre master secret. This does not necessarily mean that no side channels uh, to, for leading zero bytes is present in the implementation, as a lot of big number libraries do not maintain a fixed size during computation, and the leading zero bytes might have to be added back in by the developer afterwards, which can create a small timing side channel. However, this is not a problem with a specification anymore, but an implementation specific one. But even if leading zero bytes are leaked in an elliptic curve if you have a handshake, it is an open question if this is exploitable as the resulting equation system is, as far as we know, not solvable with the given parameters with current techniques. I would like to talk now about the Raccoon attack uh, and how it interacts with TLS 1.3, the newest version of TLS. Fortunately, TLS 1.3 preserves leading zero bytes for elliptic curve Diffie Hellman, as well as finite field Diffie Hellman. Therefore, only implementation specific sidechains may leak the leading zero bytes. David Benjamin introduced this change in draft 13, which prevented the protocol from breaking. Additionally, ephemeral key reuse is less prevalent in TLS 1.3 than it was in TLS 1.2. And therefore, um, uh, it's not uh, exploitable usually. However, there are variations of TLS 1.3 that explicitly encourage key reuse and therefore make the implementations potentially affected by the Raccoon attack. You might also wonder why uh, is TLS stripping leading zero bytes in the first place? Well, we found the answer to this question in a Mozilla bug tracker. Apparently, as a free intended to implement PKCS3, which is the standard which describes the Diffie Hammond key exchange. And uh, that required users to keep leading zero bytes, but only wrote, to quote, a conventional Diffie Hammond computation is performed. However, since it did not explicitly mention PKCS3, nor what to do with the leading zero bytes, a lot of developers independently started stripping leading zero bytes, such that their implementations were all interoperable to one another. When SSL3 was then later adapted by the IETF and renamed to TLS, the TLS specification kept this quirk, but now explicitly demanded developers to script the leading zero bytes to stay backwards compatible with the SSL3 in that regard. When elliptic curve cipher suits were introduced much later, it was explicitly mentioned to keep leading zero bytes to prevent the confusion in the first place. 
For TS103, the design was changed to the original PKCS3 design. An expert listener might wonder why the raccoon attack is even possible in the first place, given that there exist security proofs for TLS DHE and TLS DP handling. While these proofs are formally correct, both proofs did not model the timing behavior nor the encoding of a pre-master secret for a pseudo-random function. Both proofs relied on the PF or AH assumption, which is not met by real-world implementations due to timing differences caused by the zero-byte stripping, and thus make the raccoon attack possible in the first place. To conclude, there is no need to panic. Although the raccoon attack uses a cool novel technique, exploitation is very, very difficult, and the circumstances for the attack to succeed are not commonly met. However, the attack is not TLS specific, so we will probably see the same technique applied to other applications in the future. Furthermore, the raccoon attack is, as far as we know, the first practical direct application of a hidden number problem as a cryptanalytic tool against finite field if handle in practice. This is mostly because no practical side channel was known on how to get the leading zero bytes. If you want to learn more about the Raccoon Attack, you can find the paper as well as a Q&A on our website raccoonattack.com. If you want to find out if your own servers have one of the Raccoon Attack, you can use our TLS scanner, which can also check for some implementation-specific bugs, like the previously mentioned F5 bug. Finally, if you want to contact me, you can send me a DM on Twitter or write me an email and under this address. Thanks for listening, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.